in the UK system, and he helped establish the UK National Cybersecurity Center, which is a very innovative center and something we don't currently have in the US government. And finally, we have Tucker Bailey, who's a partner at McKinsey and Company and who co-leads McKinsey's digital risk work globally. Uh, your bios are much more extensive and impressive than that, but I wanna give you time to speak. So I'll turn it over to David now. Thank you all for joining us. Well, thank you and great to be uh, with uh, this panel and thank you Anya for uh, handling so many questions uh, there for Anne and we're gonna, I'm sure have more for uh, the panel uh, as well. I wanted to start by asking our panelists what they thought was new and different that they were hearing now from the US government uh, based uh, on your experience in the first six months of the uh, Biden administration, but also based on uh, what we just heard uh, from Ann. So Ron, why don't I start with you? Uh, your experience at MasterCard, what is the difference in the way that you find you're interacting with, with governments? We've heard every president since George W. Bush talk about increasing uh, public-private uh, partnerships. Uh, is it different this time? Um, David, I, I, I have to say that uh, it does feel a lot different. Um, over the years, of course, uh, cyber has been important for many of the previous administrations. I think something that uh, I am seeing it out of this current administration is just, uh, just more active, uh, proactive interaction, uh, and delivering of uh, much more uh, information to uh, the private sector and looking to gain deeper relationships for private sector partnerships. And I, I think a lot of that's driven by uh, the adversary. I think the in the past, the breaches have been, uh, you know, information loss and citizens getting a, a letter that says their information is compromised. Now you're seeing like people can't get gas. So people might not be able to get meat. Just you're you're seeing like physical manifestations of, of, of damage. And I think all of that's been a catalyst of why the administration has just been so active with the EOs and all the other outreach that they're doing uh, to get us to work uh, closer with. Active or active and effective. I mean, obviously we're still seeing, you know, ransomware has been uh, pretty much an all time high. Uh, we're still seeing some state sponsored hacks. I don't, you're, I'm sure, uh, get a, a daily uh, sense of, of what the attacks are like on your system. Is it making a difference? Uh, I, so I'll say active, and I think the effective we'll see. We'll see it manifest itself over time. Um, it's still too. It's still early days for us to to see what the effect of the activity is. But just in uh, the greater interaction that we're having, and I suspect that we'll do. Like just on uh, exercises, um, joint exercises. Like we've had CyberStorm as a way for cross section, cross sector infrastructure organizations to uh, exercise large scale cyber events with the government. I think just in some of the interactions, you'll we'll see that that tempo of it uptick and also the level of. Uh, activity, the, the, the amount of effort that we'll have to put into it so that we can get better about um, participating, like not just table topping, but actually using technologies to help our, uh, our responders, both within the private sector and the government, get better about uh, responding. I, I think those are to come. We just, uh, we just engaged in lock shields, which was a NATO-led exercise where um, you know, NATO countries, along with the private sector, engaged in cyber uh, exercise that include included the use of actual technology to to, to mimic or simulate um, just bad activity and responding to it. I, I think we're on the, the verge of seeing some real change, um, but we need a little more time. Tucker, one of the recurring themes of what we heard from Anne before was that we're basically making up for lost time. And that despite a decade of rising cyber threats, we had a large sector, a large part of the private sector sort of asleep at the wheel here. Um, we're not talking about major financial institutions like uh, RONs uh, or even the major utilities, which I know invested a lot in it. 
but the ease with which Colonial Pipeline got brought to a halt or uh, JBS, the meat distributor, um, or even the ease with which solar winds was attacked in such a sophisticated a way, I think surprised people. Um, your consultancy has a lot of different clients that deal with this. Um, is my surprise unwarranted here? No, I think, David, what we've seen is that industries and companies that have experienced day-to-day -day either financial or intellectual property losses due to cyber um, have come up the learning curve quite quickly, right? Because they have a financial incentive to do so. So, you know, you see you know, big financial institutions and, and others really investing behind cybersecurity and building, quite frankly, world-class cybersecurity teams. I think those industries that haven't seen the day-to-day -day operational losses are playing a little bit of catch up, but they realize where they are, that in many cases, they represent a significant strategic threat. So while there aren't day-to-day -day operational uh, issues from cyber, you know, recognizing the potential presence of adversaries on their network could pose a strategic risk. I think they have increasingly found a willing partner in the federal government to uh, help them understand the nature of those risks, the tactics, techniques, and procedures of the adversary. And I think to, to Anne's point about the federal government role modeling some of this, I think the executive order, by putting explicit timelines on some of these actions, has really driven um, a lot of effectiveness. And we're starting to see that trickle down. Um, you know, the federal government is a significant buyer of goods and services from the private sector. Many of our clients are now saying, how do we compete on security as a differentiator? And how can we actually telegraph security along with traditional cost schedule and performance type things, you know, as a differentiator? So I, I think we're, we are playing catch up, but industries are recognizing the strategic threat. And, you know, coming back to ransomware, that's a, that's a topic that, you know, affects every industry uh, independently. So while, you know, other folks may not have seen operational losses, Ransomware, I think, is really waking people up to this issue across the board. And what did you think, Tucker, of her answer on paying ransoms themselves? Whether or not, the, as she seemed to suggest that she had come into the job thinking, yeah, let's ban paying ransoms, and basically got convinced that that wasn't always the way to go operate, that you just drive it underground. Yeah, I, I've been... Uh, personally surprised at the extent to which ransomware payments happen, uh, many of which you know, happen without a lot of public fanfare. And at the end of the day for companies, this is a business decision, right? So in a world where you know, these are happening day to day, there's clear cost benefit analysis. If you can get a perspective on the, and, and I shudder to say this, the relative trustworthiness of your attackers and that they will actually unlock uh, and decrypt your data, it becomes a business decision. Um, where they're starting to struggle and see other challenges is this concept of extortion, right? So it's not just locking up the data and providing the encryption keys, it's if you don't pay us, we'll actually release your data publicly. Um, so even if you have great backups and you know, you're able to restore your network without paying a ransom, you're not facing that uh, extortion problem. I think the other challenge on the ransomware front is this is the topic du jour, but companies are still facing the traditional threats of intellectual property theft, you know, other types of financial fraud through cyber means, as well as this uh, strategic challenge. Um, and they're also starting to look around the corner and say, what's next? And a topic that comes up quite a bit is, you know, this notion of malign influence and can we actually influence the market to make financial gains, et cetera. So, while organizations have to address the ransomware threat today, looking around the corner and saying, you know, what is the ransomware of next year or tomorrow is increasingly important as well. Uh, Robert, you uh, are a few years out from uh, having uh, uh, been facing the kind of issues that you heard Ann Neuberger deal with. And of course, GCHQ, while it doesn't get, um, you know, uh, as, as much uh, attention and, you know, no Bond movie has ever um, focused right in on operations uh, in, in the donut you're, you're uh, building out there, which I, I should point out was before Apple uh, stole your uh, design for a donut. Um, uh, 
I'm wondering what you thought of her answer about the limitations of doing uh, a offensive activity back at those who are doing either ransomware attacks or state-sponsored attacks. You had to go balance the same kind of issue uh, at GCHQ. Well, hi, David, uh, and great to be with you and great to be at Aspen, even, even virtually. Um, yeah, I, I, I think you're viewed from this side of the water. On your first question, it does feel that something is different about this administration's approach to cyber. And even the appointments, you know, Anne is a terrific appointment. I've worked with her before, and Chris English, Jen Easterly at CISA. I think they are people who understand the strategy, but also have done the operations. So that will make a big difference. Um, so that, that inspires confidence over here, I think. On offensive cyber, I, I thought Anne handled it uh, very well, actually, because as you said, and you, you illustrate brilliantly in your book, offensive cyber is something that people reach for in an emotional way because it feels like, you know, we're hitting back, we're doing what they do to us. Actually, it's much more complex for that. Uh, and I think she set out the constraints really well, and there are three, really, which you also talk about. Uh, one is the, the fact that um, your defense has to be really good if you're going to you're going to take aggressive offensive action and everybody admits that we are way behind um, where we should be and it's asymmetric anyway we have an open economy um, open networks so even if we've been better at defense we would be um, asymmetrically open to attack in a way that our adversaries aren't the second is a collateral damage and escalation as we've seen over the years that's really difficult to to predict in cyber, it's not like a kinetic weapon where you can measure exactly what the impact will be. And Anne referred to that too. And then I think the biggest for me though is values, which you, you referred to, David. Um, you know, we don't want to behave in the way that our adversaries do but because um, the Russians want to put pressure on the regime in Ukraine, they will switch domestic power off in the winter just to make a point. I can't see uh, any United States or UK or European government wanting to do that. That's not part of our values. We're trying to build or rebuild uh, a values-driven, um, rules-based world order. And the way to do that isn't to uh, throw things out of the window. So I thought she, she very honestly said, this is, this is complex. Um, anything else that she said that surprised you? And uh, maybe a version of the same question uh, that uh, we were just discussing with Tucker, which is um, there is a sense that many American companies, I'm sure you feel the same way about British companies, were kind of asleep at the wheel in the past decade, where you had all these headlines about cyber attacks. We had Sony, we had the uh, attacks on um, uh, Baltimore and Atlanta, we had attacks on casinos in the US. We had attacks on water systems. Uh, Europe wasn't a whole lot better. And yet we still have this absence of resilience. I think that's true. And one of the really encouraging things about the administration's approach has been this focus on resilience and improving defenses. And that very long executive order that came up very quickly is really focused on that. Uh, and you're absolutely right about the sleep at the wheel. I noticed when the uh, FBI and CISA published that list of 2030 favorite vulnerabilities that are exploited, CVs that are exploited by attackers. And the thing that struck me is how old they are. You know, these are not very recent vectors for attack. And you mentioned Colonial Pipeline. It looks like a failure to do two-factor authentication, you know, basic or password management, failure to patch. All the stuff we've been talking about for 10, 15 years hasn't been done. And I would say there are two conversations going on. There's conversation at the high level, best organizations in the world, talking about the next threats and how to meet them. But for the rest of the economy, including some of our biggest utilities and CNI companies, they're not even doing the basics at the moment. And that, that's what needs to change. That's the baseline that needs to, to rise. And I thought um, Anne, Anne seemed to really grasp that. And that's what it's all about. Um, Ron, we were discussing resilience here before. and um... It might be worth drilling down a little bit about the difference between defenses and resilience. Um, people understand what you do about defense, but let's face it, you're going to, you know, you're attacked all the time, and sooner or later, an attacker is going to be successful no matter 
uh, what you do and how good you are. Um, so how does a company like MasterCard think about resilience? In other words, if you were hit by a massive state-sponsored or ransomware attack that brought down all the MasterCard websites, made it difficult, if not impossible, for me to pay my bill, though I wouldn't necessarily object to that. <laughs> um, uh, what is your ability then to basically stand up an entirely new system right away or back up the data on the old system right away so that you could essentially tell the ransomware operators, thanks, you might as well take a hike, we're not paying. Yeah, so uh, David, I like the way you phrase the question, defenses versus resiliency. And you know, we, we can go on in depth about defenses, but on the resiliency side, I think one of the things first off that um, uh, people should uh, at least be hardened by, hardened by is that um, we think about resiliency every day uh, at MasterCard. We have to enable transactions within nanoseconds and we're built in such a way that should uh, an attacker actually take uh, the main body of MasterCard out, our customers or the issuers and uh, acquiring banks can still operate without us for a good period of time while we you know, reestablish ourselves. It's like tri-dundancy is what we have. So like you can take out either of our, any of our data centers and we'll recover. But even if you were to take them down, transactions can still happen without us. Um, so th that's a good thing. We, we often think about what we can do to further um, create additional layers of resiliency. And you know, we engage in something called threat casting, which is a technique of... Um, uh, calculating where your adversary will be in a, at a 10 year mark. And it's something we've picked up from both the army and the US Secret Service. Both of those agencies use threat casting and what they do. And they, you actually use a futurist to help uh, in that uh, assessment. Um, and I, I didn't know there was an actual job called a futurist, but you engage in a futurist and you bring in subject matter experts and you think about where your adversary will be in 10 years. And while the main body of our security program is focused on the now and the near term, the threat casting projects longer out so that when we hit those gates or when we're looking for where that adversary will be, we'll either be in a different position than they, they would expect, expect us to be or we're able to respond to them. And then another point on resiliency is, you know, uh, we think about the greater payments ecosystem beyond MasterCard. So if, if we are secure and the transactions are being, merchants are being compromised and things are just happening uh, wholesale that cardholders lose trust or confidence in payment payments, that uh, that's a problem for us. And so we think about what we can do to get greater resiliency in the rest of the ecosystem beyond just us. Uh, and so we engaged in things like, um, we partnered with the Global Cyber Alliance to uh, enable you know, small and medium businesses to today, um, they can learn about security controls, techniques and technologies, and then they can actually get free tools like backing up, scanning, they can get all that stuff today and enable it to protect their, their organizations, to raise the bar, to make it harder for other people within the whole payments ecosystem to become a victim. Mm. Well, the um, Aspen Security Forum and the Strategy Group were all futurists, so you've got to, you know, we, we, <laughs> we just may we just may not be very good at predicting it, but you know, we like to think of ourselves that way. Uh, Tucker, let me ask you a, a, a version of the same question. So, when you sit down with your clients, I'm sure they're thinking first about defense because they're reading the headlines and they know that you know what ends the tenure of a chief executive is you know, an attack like the one that hit Target, for example, or um, has hit so many other um, uh, uh, businesses. But how much do they also think about uh, resiliency? Yeah, it's your, your point is spot on. And I think you are not going to defend your way out of this problem. You're not going to spend your way out of this problem. Uh, bigger walls, you know, are going to give marginal protection, but not absolute protection. Uh, you do have to have the basic hygiene on the defensive side, no question about it. But 
you know, where we see leading companies investing their marginal dollar is on the resilient side. So how quickly can we detect activities? How quickly can we attribute them to a known threat pattern, uh, if not a threat actor? How quickly can we neutralize that threat, mitigate and, and recover? Um, and one of the concepts that we've seen uh, many organizations embrace is this notion of anti-fragility, which is that a cyber incident or attack doesn't actually weaken us, but it makes us stronger because it starts to inoculate us against that type of attack. But what that requires is a certain level of organizational agility to recognize what's happening, feed that back into your processes such that you're now defending against not just that type of attack, but it's uh, variants. So this notion of how quickly can we detect, how quickly can re we respond and can we ensure some level of inoculation and in that we haven't just mitigated this attack, we've now inoculated ourselves against this type of issue going forward. And, and that quite frankly requires a, a different level of organizational agility and, and mindset if you're really gonna bring in kind of that anti-fragile thinking to, uh, to quote Nassim Taleb. So uh, Robert, you spent you know, years in government and then uh, finished up at GCHQ, and now you find yourself uh, in the private sector and in this space as well. Do these questions we've been debating today look very different to you now that you're in the private sector, wondering why those idiots in government don't get their act together, than it did when you were in the government, wondering why those idiots in the private sector didn't get their act together? Yeah, exactly. It's great to be able to blame both sides. <laughs> I mean, two examples, and the ransomware is a great example. Having sat with companies who are having to make that decision at the board level, it really gives you an insight into whether it's such a good idea to just ban ransomware. And I, I think the process that Anne's obviously gone through, I, I've also gone through. It's easy for the regulator because you don't have to pay to, to ban something. But there are a lot of companies that would just go out of business, and it's a simple business decision, as Chuck has said. I think the real answer to your question, though, is I think we have shift. We need to shift the dial on what government does. So ten years ago, in the United States and the United Kingdom, I think government thought its role was to protect um, sensitive government networks and data, and to give some advice and hope the private sector got better. I think what we've all realised, and governments will become late to this, is that we need to be more interventions. There has to be some regulation. We have to use the power of government as a procurer, um, as Tucker said, and CMMC is a great example of the defense space. Actually, just raising standards and saying some minimum things have to happen to stop the really easy stuff getting through. Of course, there's no 100% protection, but you've got to raise that baseline. So, although we've talked a lot about private sector being asleep at the wheel, I think I would also say governments have have come to this quite late and have realized they need to be much more active. And it, it's good to see the administration following through on that. Robert, I have one other I wanted to ask you. In the Q&A with Anne, we began discussing the question of whether there are some kind of guardrails, common understandings that countries can reach. Um, Brad Smith at, uh, at Microsoft refers to this as a digital Geneva Convention one in which we sort of agree on things that couldn't hit civilians, much like the Geneva Conventions were designed to protect civilians against outrageous acts by, by um, states and others. And while of course there are continue to be um, attacks that violate the, the physical world Geneva Convention, Syria is a really great example. Um, at least there is an understanding that maybe one day President Assad will find himself in front of an international criminal court to go answer for the gassing of his own people. Can you imagine us moving to a similar moment in cyber where national leaders could be dragged in front of a criminal court of some kind for allowing ransomware operators to operate on their territory for ordering the SVR to uh, go off and do something like solar winds? Well, I wish I could say I could foresee that. I, I've sat through a lot of these negotiations, uh, particularly on, on rules of the road. But I think we're a very, very long way from it. 
really because cyber is a reflection of the rest of geopolitics. Um, and I don't think it, it's going to be exceptional. Take any, a simple example, some of the rants of my family we've just been discussing are coded so they can't be called on machines running Russian language sort of settings uh, or 16 other settings you know, around the former Soviet Union, including Syria, you just mentioned Syria. So, uh, you know, in any other sphere, that would be fairly amazing that a, 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 a prime, a prime business model couldn't be applied to the country of the So against that background, given the money involved, given the state of relations between countries, this looks like a, a very big ask and a, a long walk. But I still think it's worth discussing, and I think it's therefore a good thing that um, out of the G7, uh, these discussions between Russian and uh, American experts have started, but it is going to be a very long haul, and it won't be until relations generally improve. Do you think it's a real discussion, or you think that uh, Putin sees a moment here to, sure, bury this in some kind of uh, task force between the U.S., and Russia gives Putin the chance to say, oh, we're working with the international community while freeing up the SVR or the GRU or the ransomware actors to go out and do whatever it was they were going to do anyway. Yes, and we've seen this in other spheres like nuclear, but, and we shouldn't be naive about it. I still think it's better to be talking than, than not talking. And when the cost of this rises for those doing it, so particularly Russia and China, then they might start to take this seriously. But for the moment, uh, it is very low cost. Okay. And um, Ron, if I could ask you on, on the same thing, you have seen um, some companies take a leadership role in advocating for some kind of international agreements here. Um, is that the way to go? Are we more likely to see companies um, take the, the, the leading role rather than um, governments? Um, I, I think you will see companies actively participate. Um, we, I mean, there's, there's quite a lot that uh, we as the owners of the infrastructure environments, you know, have to say on, on these topics. We can't do it without our government partners. But, you know, it, it, if you look at like some of the work that the financial sector coordinating, coordination council is doing in uh, conjunction with uh, the U.S. government on, you know, working to um, uh, harmonize or um, get to uh, some some consolidation around um, standards, security standards, and those things, those standards, not just within the U.S. but even globally. The more we can uh, come up with a set of uh, security standards that we can all transparently work from, I think CMMC um, as, I think it was Tucker that mentioned it or Robert that mentioned it, that, that, that's like a great thing for the defense industrial base. The, the more we can standardize on security standards, uh, the more we can uh, transparently say how good we are and then focus on enabling security where you have a lot of different, different standards, you spend more time clicking or checking compliance boxes than actually working on security. So that's just one example of how, uh, you know, the private sector is focused on helping uh, our government partners in the U.S. and across the globe, you know, better protect the environment. Then you'll, you'll see a lot of uh, private sector companies. I mentioned the Global Cyber Alliance, but there are other things like the uh, uh, Cyber Peace Institute or um, the Cyber Readiness Institute. There are other things that within the private sector, we see there's an opportunity for us to help all, to raise all boats. Uh, like Ann said earlier that, um, you know, it's better to be in a position where you can protect yourself from becoming a victim of ransomware than ac actually having to make that decision to make a payment. So the more that we can help each other you know, uh, just raise the security level or raise the security standards for everyone out there in the environment, you know, we stand better off. And so you can expect, I, I think you should continue to see private sector companies, especially the ones that have, you know, a vested interest in everyone doing better, uh, participating actively in, in, in maturing what is happening in the world. 
Great. Well, we could go on with this for some time, but we only have eight or nine minutes left, and I wanted to allow um, time uh, for questions. So I'm going to turn it back to um, Anya. Anya, I, I think you have a, a question from Joe Nye, who taught me in a pre-cyber age and has okay. continued to um, since. So any mistakes I made this morning, you can blame Joe for all of those. So I'll, I'll turn it back to Anya and to Joe. Great. Thank you, David. And thank you, Joe. Joe, by the way, also taught me in a pre-cyber age, but has been really staying up to speed on these topics. So uh, Joe Nye, please ask your question. Thanks, David and Anya. Uh, I would love to hear this great panel say a little bit about liability and insurance. We often talk about government regulation as a way to fill the gap between what you might call the costs of hygiene to the company and the general uh, externalities for the country as a whole. Another way of bridging that gap is through the insurance industry, which essentially, if you're debating whether you're going to spend money on a fancy uh, type of, of uh, uh, cyber uh, investment, uh, you might say, well, I'll take my risks. But if your insurance company tells you, sorry, that's gonna double the cost of your insurance. You might say, well, I might as well pay it now. So the question is, there's been a, the problem of getting an actuarial base for insurance in cyber, which is lack of data because companies often don't report uh, intrusions. Then there's also the question of the extraordinary escalation in costs that we've seen with the recent wave of cyberware attacks, which are driving uh, some insurance companies out of the area. So what are the prospects for solving some of these problems of raising hygiene in general through, the, through liability legislation, but even more important through uh, the insurance industry raising its game? Um, I'm happy to start. Um, so Joe, I think that's a great question. Uh, having been through the process with our insurers a few times, I, I, I think early on with cyber insurance, um, because there's no actuarial tables or anything like that, um, identifying the, you know, the coverage amounts and how much you pay was just like, you know, it's, it's as accurate as rolling chicken bones and figuring out, you know, that's what you need to pay. I think the spate of uh, ransomware attacks and its impact on the insurance industry, they are, they are going to get better data and, and you can see them starting to leverage um, technologies to get an idea or an assessment of the insured, the, 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 the group that they're, they're gonna insure. Uh, so I expect them to use more te technology to, to get better assessments, to know, uh, you know where a company actually is and then to develop more means of getting uh, a transparent look at the security uh, program of an organization. And, and that will weigh in on, you know, the amounts they'll charge and the amount of coverage they'll get. That, that, that is just going to be another factor for companies to get their act straight in order to, to do well in those assessments so that they can get, you know, some reasonable cost insurance coverage or else uh, they're going to pay some exorbitant costs. And, and I'll build on that from the carrier side. You know, we talked about the challenge of underwriting cyber policies, the lack of actuarial data, um, but they recognize that there's a big opportunity here if they can figure that out. So, you know, I think the first wave of cyber insurance is really covering third party risk, right? Customer record breach remediation. You've got a good cost uh, to remediate those breaches and you can get some likelihood. Um, but they run into challenges where they think about things like accumulation risk and aggregation risk, where, you know, an earthquake is only going to hit generally one place at one time. So your portfolio, you have confidence in. But if you have a not patch it type attack that affects all of your insured base at the same time, that, that's a problem. I think, you know, there are other challenges around exclusions and, you know, there's still litigation, not patch it, right? Is this an act of war and therefore is a covered event? And, and so some of these things I think need to be worked out. But I do think there is real potential for insurance to, you know, provide a hedge to some of these risks, but uh, I think it will still take some doing. Yeah, I agree. 
Yeah. I mean, all, all I'd add is that uh, if we look back at technologies over the last hundred years, you know, what has, has made them safer has been this combination of regulation and insurance, usually in step together. I think we, we haven't quite got there on either. And I agree with Ron that actually insurance could use external data much better to look at their insured from an attacker's perspective. That's not been done properly. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Joe. That's a perfect question and actually a great segue to a question that I had. You know, Robert, the, the UK National Cybersecurity Center, as I understand it, is very um, novel and it's not something we have. And I could be misunderstanding it, but I think companies are allowed to report when they've been hacked without immediately exposing themselves to liability. Is that true? And could you explain a little bit more about that? And would that be a good model for the US? Well, I, I, I wouldn't say whether it'd be good for the US, but I, I think the principle behind it was to bring the private sector and government together. Um, and on your specific point, not to make this a regulator because that has a chilling effect on reporting of, of problems. Right. Make it a, a center of excellence where people can sit alongside each other and talk about problems, even attacks they're having without the fear of the regulator um, you know, finding them or coming down on them. Um, so the NCSC, advises regulators because it's an expert body, but it isn't a regulator itself. So I think it is an interesting model. It's a lot easier in the UK because our system is much smaller, there are less agencies involved, um, and yeah, the scale of the US uh, makes, it, makes it harder. But my sense is that this administration and everything that Chris Inglis did before on the Cyberspace Solarium Commission you know, points towards bringing stuff together, you know, sharing data between uh, private and public sectors and, and that has to be the way forward. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll finish with one final question that's coming in the chat and I get asked it all the time in Silicon Valley. I know it gives our government um, the heebie-jeebies, but, but it's a variation of the question, would it ever be okay for the private sector to do offensive cyber? Because in some cases, some of our tech companies are pretty capable of that. So we'll let you all weigh into that one. I'll go first then. I'll just, I'd say I think it would be a disaster. Um, the operation of offensive cyber just is bad for everybody for the unintended consequences, reasons that Anne and David touched on earlier. Uh, we've already got countries proliferating. So we've got countries like Vietnam developing offensive cyber. Uh, the last thing we need is companies doing the same. So I would, I would str strongly discourage it. Uh, yeah, I have not seen any interest from, from our client base to engage in offensive operations. They have a hard enough time uh, finding the right defensive talent. And for all the reasons Robert said, I, I, I don't think anyone would uh, seriously consider that from at least large U.S. corporations. And being from a large U.S. corporation, <laughs> uh, so th there's, there's tremendous downsides to it in like, it's like, you know, poking the eye of the bear, like you're, you're already, it, it, so I, I think we, we would really depend on our government partners for any uh, kind of um, uh, response uh, in that event. W active intelligence gathering and sharing, you know, our intelligence teams trying to evaluate what's happening and gaining more information about what it is that we see the attacker and then sharing that with our government partners and then giving us information back that, that's more of that, that, that is as close as to offensive that I see. Uh, but, um, you know, our lot is defense. That's, uh, it's primarily what we do. Um, and you know, I don't know, I don't go around poking tigers. So that's uh, right. I, I, yeah, I just stepped briefly out of my uh, moderator role and back into my reporter role for a moment, because we pursued a few cases where companies did consider this and, you know, one of the biggest risks is if you're on the receiving end of this, let's say you're, you're China and you're suddenly okay. seeing surfers okay. uh, go away, you, you suddenly have the question, who's actually attacking me? Is it the U.S. government? Is it a company that was designated by the U.S. government to do it? Is it a private actor? You know, somebody in, in Washington might not even know the cyber war had started. Right. Thank you very much. We'll tell all those white hat hackers in Silicon Valley to stand down. <laughs> um, David, Ron, Robert, Tucker, thank you. That was excellent and a great follow up from what we heard from Anne. So I appreciate all of you being with us. And I will now turn it over.